When people think of the world's best airlines, it's not hard to think of the Gulf carriers. Emirates, Etihad, and Qatar have really made a worldwide name for themselves, but there's another, smaller airline in the same region that doesn't quite get the same reputation. Enter stage left, Kuwait Airways. Not only will we get a chance to try out their product in today's video, but we will try it out in their extra special 777 Royal First Class, built to compete head-to-head -head with other Gulf carriers. Today, we'll be flying one of their longest routes from Kuwait City to Manila, Philippines roughly a nine hour flight. Although our journey technically began in Cairo as I bought this as a ticket from Cairo to Kuwait to Manila to save a bit of money. Full disclosure, I am only covering the Kuwait to Manila leg, but there are a couple shots from the Cairo to Kuwait video mixed in just because it had better lighting or content. Kuwait is building a brand new terminal as seen here on the arrival footage from my first flight from Cairo. It's set to open this year, but for the life of me, I can't figure out if Kuwait Airways is going to move to the new Terminal 2 or not. I will say, however, that Kuwait Airways does have their own brand new terminal that opened in 2018, Terminal 4, and we will get a good look at that space. For now, however, we arrived previously into Terminal 4 with Kuwait Airways, where we got a good look at not only some of their other 777s, but also drove right past this incredible Iran Air 747-200. Kuwait is definitely a smaller country, but very rich from their natural oil deposits. This has helped them grow their global reputation a bit more recently. I was able to book an overnight layover so that I could visit the country, and with a super easy visa on arrival process, and incredibly wonderful immigration officers, and airport and airline staff, the visit was wonderful. Speaking of my overnight connection, the car that I'm in right now is also operated by Kuwait Airways, as passengers in their business and first class cabins can book a complimentary airport transfer. Just make sure to book it more than 24 hours in advance so they can fit it into their schedule. Still a great touch for those paying for first or business class. Our airport transfer was able to pick us up and drop us off right at the curb for Terminal 4, which is solely for Kuwait Airways. Because of this, all the signage and advertising is for Kuwait Airways, which we see first plastered on the large windows curbside. From the curb here, we also got our first look at the five-year-old Terminal 4 at Kuwait International Airport, home to only Kuwait Airways. Inside, we see the wonderfully detailed and accented entrance hall, including vaulted ceilings, embedded lighting, and some wonderful use of accents on the floors and walls, making one of the best looking terminals I've seen to date. It is a bit small, makes sense as it only houses one airline, which isn't too big, much, much smaller than its Gulf region competitors. One end of the hallway houses the arrivals and a couple exit doors, but the first half is for the departures. After entering the terminal, you can go all the way to the right and find the entrance to the departure hall. Before entering the departure hall is the large screen with the departures listed. Later on, this is where I would see that my flight to Manila was delayed by almost three and a half hours. Not only this flight, but in the last 14 days, it looked like the majority of them had arrived late to Manila, a few of them by more than an hour. Once in the departure hall, we find roughly 50 ticket counters. The first 10 are for premium passengers, and the rest are all for economy passengers, although there's a small group of counters dedicated for the U.S. departures since they require a bit of extra screening. Considering we were originally scheduled for a 1.45 a.m. departure, I was at the airport close to midnight, and it was fairly empty as there was only about one departure every hour-ish this time of day. Even still, I walked over to the glass enclosed area for passengers traveling in a premium cabin. There's a couple business class counters, a couple first class counters, and a couple royal class counters, which is what we are flying in today. I popped a squat in one of these couches waiting for an agent as there was no one at the counters when I first arrived. Within a few minutes of arriving, however, an employee flagged down an agent that could come and help. He went to one of the business class counters and a few of us that were waiting got in line to check in. Outbound immigration and security was located directly outside the check-in counters, and with how busy it was at the moment, both steps took me a total of about two minutes max, and then I was out into the terminal, starting with the large Kuwait duty-free store. 
The second I was out of the duty free shop, I found it comical to find things like a Raisin Cane's, Shake Shack, Starbucks, and McDonald's, like I never left the United States. There are two levels of Terminal 4, the bottom level where we are is all of the bus gates, and then upstairs is the jet bridges. There's also lounges on both levels and we will see those. While I don't know the exact date, at the far end of the lower level, freshly opened, the downstairs lounges are brand new and so I decided to hang out there for a while. The main lounge is the business class lounge as there's many more business class passengers, but adjacent to that is the much smaller, much more exclusive lounge specifically for first class passengers. When I got to the lounge, there was only one other person in there who left after just an hour or so, and then it was just me and the kind people helping out around the lounge. Because of its size, the lounge is fairly intimate. Not a whole lot of seating, but also not a whole lot of people, so it all works out. The nice thing is that it seemed like all the tables besides the dining tables had charging ports. There aren't a whole lot of places for groups to sit, as most of the seats are arranged next to each other rather than having groups most likely because there's far less groups of people who fly in first class together. As soon as I got in the lounge, one of the attendants came over and asked what he could get me. There is a buffet, but the attendants try their best to make sure that everyone can be served by them rather than needing to get up and do things themselves. They continued around the lounge monitoring how people were doing to get them what they needed, although I was the only one in the lounge, so I did get a lot of attention. The buffet did have some dinner options. It was about 1 a.m. at this point and dinner was served until 2.30 when they cleaned it up and planned for breakfast starting at 4. I did get some time to look around the buffet at all of the options that they had. However, when it came time to actually getting a plate of food, the attendant was insistent upon getting my plate ready for me and then bringing it over to my table. All I had to do was point and tell him what I wanted. I got a few things, all based on the attendant's recommendations, so I ended up with a little bit of most things, including a quinoa salad and a fruit cup and three little finger sandwiches, then an okra beef entree that was incredible. Near the entrance of the lounge was also a workstation, and in there was two computers and a printer along with some extra counter space. It was honestly a great place to get some work done if you needed to. The only thing about this lounge is that there's not any restrooms located within the lounge. Passengers were able to use the restrooms in the business class lounge just next door and then return to the first class lounge, or they can use the restrooms in the terminal. Kind of strange honestly though for a first class lounge. Honestly though, it was eerily quiet in the lounge and after a while I found it a bit strange being in here all alone. So since there was another lounge, I figured I would go and check that one out instead. Past the bus gates and back near the exit from the duty free shop, we come across an escalator to the upper level of the terminal. This escalator takes us up to the D gates for all of the gates with jet bridges as well as the Oasis lounge. This area is used for the majority of the wide body flights, our flight today included. Up here we also see some signage from the check-in area marking the specific areas for the New York flights, which was the only US bound flight at the time, although DC flights are resuming soon. In addition to that, gate D1 at the far end of the terminal is specifically the gate for US flights as there's an extra channel of security checks. This is common for a whole lot of the international flights going to the US. We see some additional restaurants up here as well for people who want to hang out a bit closer to their gate. And then we get to gates D7 and 8 which are ours for Manila. Although the inbound plane from London was still running late, so I had time to explore the lounge directly across from our gate. The Oasis Lounge, which is the older lounge in their main terminal, until the downstairs one opened up. Just like the downstairs lounge, there's two sides. One was the first class lounge and one was the business class lounge, although with the opening of the downstairs lounges, it seems that both of these are accessible to first and business class passengers. I went to the business class lounge first since it was a little bit bigger and seemed to have a little bit more selection of places to sit, things to eat, and things to do. However, there is someone in there having a very loud phone conversation, so after long I decided to go adventure to the other side, to the first class lounge, where once again I was the only person in the lounge. The lounge upstairs for first class passengers was definitely smaller 
and seemed a bit older, although I guess this terminal did open in 2018, so at the very oldest, it's only about five years. Still a good place to hang out, and obviously I'm the only person in here, so it was plenty cozy. Amongst the places to hang out with in this lounge, there's also some places to work, as long as a prayer room off to the side, and a smoker's lounge. Now from my experience, on both of my flights, Cairo to Kuwait and Kuwait to Manila, I was the only person in the first class cabin, so it makes sense that the lounges were still fairly empty. With a insanely good priced first class, you would think they'd fill up a little bit more, but I guess they're just struggling to take a slice of that pie that Emirates, Etihad, and Qatar have taken over, especially with a much smaller fleet size and a much smaller sample size of destinations. Our flight just kept getting delayed a little bit more and a little bit more while I watched our inbound plane head towards us from London. In the meantime, I enjoyed my lounge all to myself, enjoyed the private shower suites that they had available for everyone, and before long, our plane had finally arrived and I decided to head out so I could be one of the first people to board the airplane. I want to take a second to thank Sterling Pacific, the premium luggage brand, creating wonderfully reinforced luggage perfect for the frequent travelers of the world. They were gracious enough to sponsor this video as well as sending me my new carry-on bag that's going to be sprinkled throughout this video. Not only that, but they provided a discount code for those of you looking to get your own premium luggage, so stay tuned for that at the end of this. At first glance, I'm honestly just impressed with how sturdy this thing is. I mean, this thing is built like a tank. There is no give on this hard shell. I'm also surprised because typically I prefer the four wheel setup on these suitcases. However, it really only works on hard, smooth surfaces. So having the two wheel option in my suitcases is actually kind of nice to have as I'm traveling around the world. I'll also say that honestly, walking around with a suitcase this nice, I feel kind of important, even just walking around my house. So I'm excited to walk around the airport with it as well. For those of you looking to get a new suitcase, they've got the 35 liter option, which I've got here, and the 80 liter option available on their website, all with that same 5052 aluminum hard shell alloy and the A380 load bearing aluminum corners as well, in addition to those Italian leather handles you've got on the top and the sides of that suitcase. They've basically taken the parts of the normal suitcases that are usually cheap plastic, like the wheel wells, the handle casing, stuff like that, and turned it into that same aluminum alloy. So you're getting this nice, strong aluminum casing throughout. So while it might not be the cheapest suitcase on the market, you're definitely getting the quality that you're paying for. For those of you that are looking to get one of these bags, use my promo code Patrick or go to sterlingpacific.com slash Patrick for $300 off your purchase of Sterling Pacific Premium Luggage. Let's head back to the journey. Eventually, gate lights became a serious problem, so I went up and asked if they were boarding first class passengers first or if they were just going to call for everyone. Fortunately, once they heard I was first class, they immediately scanned my boarding pass and let me on board, so I was not only alone in the jet bridge, but I was alone on the airplane for a matter of about five minutes. And with that, I welcome you to the 121 first class cabin of the 777-300 belonging to Kuwait Airways. With a pretty high suite wall and the fully enclosed suites themselves, you would think that they'd be able to compete head-to-head -head pretty well with the other Gulf carriers. Doesn't seem to quite be the case, but we'll take a look at the performance numbers shortly. My seat today will be Suite 2K, which is the only one that was booked on today's flight. The other two seats that ended up being used were by the pilots that were sleeping during the journey. While everyone else boards this airplane, let's take a look at the suite that we have for this 9 hour flight out to Manila and you guys can make your own decisions on whether or not it meets the industry standard for a long haul first class service. Starting off, the shell around the seat does have some nice accents with the cushions along the back and the accent walls along the side. In addition, you also have this large headrest that can tilt up and down, it can also curve in on the sides to make it very comfortable. Over your left shoulder here is this panel along the side which includes a few things including a reading light over your shoulder that can be pivoted and I used a lot when I was using my tray table. In addition, next to that we have our individual air vent. Instead of being on the ceiling, it's right here, it's a little bit easier for us to reach. We also have another light here that can be pivoted so really anywhere in the suite you've got plenty of lighting. Speaking of which, this area underneath is another light, just a little accent light though. 
Below that is one of the many storage areas that we have in the seat. This large cubby fit a laptop, chargers, extra sweatshirts, anything that I could need. It was a huge size and honestly better than most underseat storage that we see nowadays. Continuing along the aisle, we of course have the closed doors. A fantastic feature of some suites, it gives you plenty of privacy, especially with the height of the walls of this suite. Directly in front of you is even more storage and accents to help make this seat even a little more special. Right along the door, you have this little coat cubby. Inside of there, there is a few hangers, so if you have a suit or maybe you have extra layers of jackets that you just want to store for the flight, you can hang them up here and keep them in the cabinet throughout the flight. I was, however, a little sad not to have a flower in the flower holder mounted on the wall. This large area in front of you serves multiple functions. First things first, it's of course the footrest. The padding does make it pretty comfortable if you've got the seat in the right position. Underneath that flap, however, is more storage, even bigger than the one in the armrest, and I used this instead of any sort of overhead bins. Perhaps the best feature, however, is you can see the seat belts here. This can be turned into a partner seat, so if you're traveling with someone else in the first class cabin, as long as it's not takeoff or landing, they can join you in your suite and they'll serve all your meals and whatever else you might need right to your suite for both of you. The extra cushion around the edge of it also helps to be a nice back and side rest for that person joining you. You also have this large TV directly in front of you that's controlled by the remote. We'll take a look at all that a little bit later. Now moving along the window side, first things first, just like Emirates has, they have the self-serve bar, stocked with sodas and waters and some mixed nuts to help you in flight between the normally scheduled and a la carte meal services. Next to that is where you have a countertop that's really not the widest thing in the world, as you can see it's only about as wide as my hand. However, underneath that is where the tray table is stored. Real quick, with the push of a button, it pretty much releases itself, all you have to do is pull it down, and it is massive. I guess it has to be if it's going to serve two people using the buddy seat. The main controls for the suite are located just beyond that. Opening up the flap on the side armrest, you can see this nice little screen. Once initialized and choosing your language, you can control all different things. You can control the seat, you can control the lighting in the suite, you can control your do not disturb mode and the refreshment rack. Anything that has to do with the seat is controllable here. Then you have another flap that opens up, this one hosting the remote. At this point I figured I could just keep opening trap doors and finding all kinds of hidden secrets. Below that is the charging and even more storage for the seat. First things first, you have the charging and headset jacks. You have two USB, a universal charging port, and the normal headset jack. If you do have something plugged in, there's some great storage space right next to it, which had space for a water bottle, but was extra big so I was able to fit phones or portable charging packs there as well. The literature pocket was also next to that, including things like the safety card, the air sickness bag, and the headset that came with the seat. I do also plan to cover it in a future video, but you can see just behind the first class cabin is plenty of rows of the business class cabin in a 2-2-2 setup, hardly industry leading if they are trying to go head to head with the best of the world's airlines. Now we of course have to take a look through the amenities that were given to us with the suite. Starting off, within seconds of sitting down I was offered my pre-departure beverage, I decided to go with a lemon mint along with the mixed nuts and hot towels that I was delivered. I of course had to compare that lemon mint to the type that you would get on airlines like Qatar and Emirates. As I mentioned previously, there's a bunch of stuff in the literature pocket, obviously including a safety card, an air sickness bag, and a bag for donations, which I usually use to get rid of any foreign currency I don't want anymore. But perhaps the extra bonus was this nice little notepad. Similar to what you would find on Emirates, however this one seems to be beat up a little bit so I'm assuming it's been sitting in here for a little while, not many people wanting to take it home with them. The headset also came in this nice leather pouch, however unfortunately the headset wasn't exactly industry changing. The noise cancelling may have been good and it did come with the little protective ear covers, but it wasn't the most comfortable unfortunately, similar to the type you'd find in most business classes. Taking a look now through the bedding, as this is where airlines can really set themselves apart. The pillow first off was a great pillow, one of the better ones I've had. It was a good size, it was a good firmness, and I didn't really have to supplement it with anything else. 
The mattress pad is great to have, however, it's pretty thin compared to the other Gulf carriers, especially first class. I mean, Emirates is basically a half inch thick memory foam pad. Good to have it nonetheless though. The comforter, however, was insanely comfortable and very substantial. The only drawback is I felt the cabin was still a little warm and even with my individual air vent, I didn't end up needing it for this flight. We were also handed out our immigration forms for the Philippines, which really helped on arrival to help expedite that process. Perhaps my favorite part of the pre-departure experience on these Gulf carriers is the Arabic coffee and Arabic sweets. We did get those of course, but look at that small pour of Arabic coffee. Compared to Emirates and Qatar, I honestly find it a little bit embarrassing. You may notice that there's a couple of big things missing from the amenities. First things first, there's no champagne. Kuwait Airways is actually a dry airline. You'll notice that neither in the lounge nor on the flight there is any alcoholic beverages. One of the few airlines to still observe this to this day. Perhaps the biggest thing that's missing, however, is the amenity kit. At no point on this flight were we offered any sort of amenity kit, which is bizarre for a nine hour long haul first class experience. I mean, you're never gonna meet the standards of the other carriers in the area if you're missing something as simple as an amenity kit. And it's not that they've gotten rid of them altogether, as according to the flight attendant, New York and London and other routes like that still offer those amenity kits, but my flight from Cairo to Manila, I never got one on either leg. Bizarre. I will say though that while their safety video played, I had some great joy at watching the sign language that was playing in addition to the text at the bottom of the screen. I don't think I've seen this on any other airline, but I'm sure someone that's difficult at hearing would have a much easier time watching the sign language than reading a bunch of text. In the air now with the mood lighting on, first things first, we of course have to get that door shut. Now we can take a look through the in-flight entertainment options on board Kuwait Airways. And while it's definitely not close to the likes of Qatar and Emirates, which just seem to have endless options, there is still plenty of stuff to watch on their seatback TVs. I had more than enough for my flight to Manila, and even if I were to fly them a couple times, I'd still have enough stuff to keep me entertained. As is usual, there's far less TV show options than there are movie options, especially once we sort by English. 
under each selection there's a few different episodes, but definitely less than Qatar and Emmerich which tend to have full seasons, even multiple full seasons of certain shows. They did have a documentary section including a documentary on Shaq, and one on Elon Musk. The sports section did have a few options from different sports, mostly soccer, or I guess what the rest of you guys call football. They also had a whole section under the video tab titled Kuwait TV, which I'm assuming is just TV series that are specifically shown within the country of Kuwait. The video section then ends with the kids TV, which has all of the TV series specifically for kids shows. The audio section was mostly Arabic music. I honestly struggled for a little while to find English music until I sorted by genre. Once I sorted by genre, I was able to find some highlights in pop and hip hop and rap genres. Mostly just a single album that had some top hits at the moment, but I was pleasantly surprised at the songs they chose to have on that album. Perhaps most surprising though is the Kane Brown album with US country music. As is fairly normal on these Middle East carriers, there's a section for those practicing Islam where you can read the Quran or use the Qibla compass. The boutique section was next, which I assumed to be more like an onboard duty free section, although it was currently unavailable at this time. There was also the 3D map section, which in addition to having the moving map, had two separate camera views. We had a forward camera and a downward facing camera. In the last tab on the top was the About Us tab. I did have some fun with this, there's a section about the history of the airline, a section about the destinations, some messages from their chairman, some ads, and information about their mileage plan. A couple features to help you sort through things. First off is that you do have a favorites button to add things to your list. Easy to find at the bottom of your screen and when pulling that up, you can see all the things that you've saved under movies, TV shows, and audio. In addition, you do have a search feature, so if you're looking for something, you can also just start typing it in and help you find what you might be looking for. Perhaps the main drawback is that the TV screen itself is not touchscreen. Not the end of the world since you're so far back from the TV, it just means that you have to use that TV remote. The benefit about the remote is that it does have a screen on it, and so you don't even have to look at the TV screen. You can do everything you need directly on the face of the remote, which is touchscreen, and then watch whatever programs, view whatever maps or cameras you want on the main screen in front of you or on the remote. Now here's the thing with the Wi-Fi on Kuwait Airways. They do have it on board and the purser helped me find it, however it wasn't actually available on my flight. At no point was I able to actually purchase a plan. That brings me to my second point. According to the purser, if you're in first class you can get free messaging through their Wi-Fi, but you still have to pay full price for their internet. This can run you as high as $40 if you're just trying to get some Wi-Fi for your flight. If you're paying first class prices, Wi-Fi is just one of the things you'd expect to be included. Then it was time to look through the menu to make my choice for the first meal on our flight. I was pleasantly surprised to see this nice welcome on board note on the front page, and following that was a couple menus, one in Arabic and one in English. We were scheduled two meals on this flight, a breakfast and then a normal lunch or dinner service. However, the crew did advise me that I could order a la carte whenever I wanted. It really wasn't all that long after takeoff before the flight attendant came by to make our table for the breakfast service. I sat back, enjoyed the mood lighting, and watched the sunset out of my window as we made our way away from the Arabian Gulf. Starting off with the hot drinks, I had to of course go with the Karak Chai, a favorite of mine whenever I'm in the Middle East. I did admittedly have to use the seat controls to move myself just a little bit closer to the tray table so I wasn't spilling food and drink all over my lap. The first course was a simple cheese and fruit platter. It came with some cheeses, dried fruits, fresh fruits, and nuts. I liked the green cheese, although I couldn't help but feel like it was a little bit Dr. Seuss green eggs and ham kind of feeling. We also got a bread basket with more breakfast assorted breads, as when we got our later meal, it did have a different selection slightly. I also have another contestant for all time favorite airline silverware. You know I love when they inscribe their logo on the forks and knives, however that extra little detail throughout the silverware was an amazing touch in my books. Even the salt and pepper shakers got in on the action with a little bit of decorative Kuwait Airways logos on them. I decided to have my breakfast with the herb omelette which was also served alongside some caramelized carrots, some turkey bacon, and some asparagus. Maybe not the nicest first class meal I've ever had in the world, but it was good. 
Honestly, just between the size of the tray table and the console to my right side, I was just amazed with the sheer amount of space that I had. I really could spread out and do whatever I needed in this space. The meal then wrapped up with another hot towel service. It was a nice way to freshen up after eating my breakfast. After the meal wrapped up, I was able to kick back, relax, and enjoy the beautiful landscape of Iran, a country I would love to visit. However, unfortunately, as an American, it is an increasingly difficult visa to get. Then it felt like a good time to explore the seat modes. First things first, they do have the presets for takeoff and landing, dining, relaxing, or lying flat. In addition, you can also control individual seat controls. Here up top, you can see the adjustments for moving the seat forwards and backwards, moving the leg rest, moving the lumbar support, moving the recline, or moving the counter. Then underneath, you can hit the arrows for forwards, backwards, or up, down, depending on what you're adjusting to get your desired seat mode. I started by adjusting pieces individually, like the seat back here, where I was able to adjust the recline. Similarly, I can hit the leg rest button so I can pull that up, swing the leg rest up, and it made for a great place to rest my feet. You'll notice the sheer size of this leg rest. It was great for getting comfortable. The lumbar support also had plenty of adjustments, although in all honesty, you couldn't really tell that you were adjusting it. Then was the mode that I used mostly when I was dining to move the seat forward and backward. This was helpful to get it closer to the tray table, but also if you wanted to recline it enough, you did have to move it forward so that you had space to recline. If you used the presets, it kind of took care of this for you. One of my worries when I sat in the seat was just how far the leg rest was, but this is all the way up as far as the seat will go. And you'll see here that it becomes close enough that you can kick your feet up on the foot rest if you want. The last seat adjustment was the ability to move the armrest to my left, up or down. I'm assuming it was just in order to make it a wider surface when it was time for sleep. Now the reason I say that it was the last seat mode is because you can control other things here, like the refreshment rack, which with the push of a button could be moved up or down to retract into that armrest. There was also a number of lights that could be controlled using this. For starters, one of the main reading lights that you had on the wall to your left, the one that did not have a button directly on it. In addition to that, we could control the accent light, which didn't light up too much, but it did make for a nice decoration to the suite, especially once it was dark in the cabin. In addition was the little floodlights throughout the seat. The first one was around the footwell, and it was kind of hard to push that button for whatever reason, but once I got it, you could see here the lights underneath the TV that shined down onto the footwell lit up, and it did make for a nice accent. And then the last light was the one behind the seat. Once again, until the cabin was dark, you couldn't really see it all that well. Each of these lights could be hit multiple times as well to roll through three different dimming settings or back off. You were also able to turn on the do not disturb mode using that side remote, which just turned the light on outside your suite so that the flight attendants and crew knew not to bother you, especially if you wanted some sleep. Then we can go through the preset modes, working our way to the fully flat bed, which is perhaps what I'm most excited for. Starting off, however, we get ourselves into the dining preset. Really doesn't do a whole lot more than prop you up a little bit more and move you closer to the tray table. Next was getting it into the relax mode. The relax mode pretty much just dumped you backwards a little bit, kind of felt like lounging in a bucket. Dumped you back into the seat, raised the footrest a little bit, but was extremely comfortable. I did hang out like this most of the time, but with the leg rest all the way up. Then, perhaps what I was most excited for, checking out the fully flat bed position. It did get itself all the way down, and the helpful thing with the preset is it also lowers that armrest at the same time. That way, once the chair is fully flat, everything else is fully flat to give you the widest possible surface. From there, we are able to add the bedding and make it possibly one of the most comfortable beds I've ever made on an airplane. Then I was really excited to make the bed with all of the stuff that came with it, including the mattress pad, which I put down first. Obviously, it's thinner than its competition, like Emirates and Qatar, which offer plenty thicker and more comfortable mattress pads, but it's nice to have a continuously flat and smooth surface. From there, we added the comforter, which, like I mentioned, is one of the more substantial comforters I've ever had, so it was plenty warm and made the bed extremely comfortable. 
The last piece that was missing here was the Kuwait Airways pillow that came with the seat. I used it mostly as lumbar support, but it was a fairly substantial and very comfortable pillow in my opinion. The bed, all put together, was extremely comfortable. Kind of a bummer I wasn't planning to sleep on this flight because I have a feeling I would have slept pretty well. Perhaps the strangest thing is that there was no turndown service offered. The flight attendants did see me making the bed as I saw their head peek out from the galley a couple times, but at no point did any of them come up and offer to make the bed. Now, typically I do turn down that turn down service, just so that I can do it myself. I feel like I don't want to inconvenience them, but it was strange in a first class cabin to not even have the offer. Obviously with the bed made in a first class cabin, there's plenty of space for your feet as you have this insanely wide foot area and without being crammed underneath a seat, you obviously can move your feet up, down, left, right without any sort of restriction. The height of the walls adding to the privacy was pretty nice on Kuwait Airways as I think only Emirates might have them beat. It made it so that with those doors shut, especially when you were fully lying flat in your bed, there was plenty of privacy for you and pretty much anybody walking past your seat couldn't see in unless they really craned their head upwards. As mentioned earlier, I was the only passenger on this flight in the first class cabin. However, 1A and 1K were being used by the pilots who were resting while the rest of the crew was taking care of the cruising portion of the flight. I suspect when they're available, it's more comfortable than the normal crew rest area. Now taking a look through the lavatory, which are usually pretty good in a first class cabin, I also had high expectations because there was no amenity kit, so I was hoping we'd see some amenities in here. The bathroom was slightly larger than the normal restrooms on the 777, however there wasn't anything necessarily special about it. I did like the design of the sink and the countertop, which was nice, however I noticed that amongst the amenities on the shelf, one thing that was missing was a flower from the flower holder. A little touch like this can go a long way towards adding your personal little touch to these first class lavatories. They did have small amenities like a comb, soap, and a dental kit, but nothing else like lotions which was kind of surprising. I did however appreciate the touchless features, the touchless flushing, and the pedal here to open and close the trash chute. After relaxing for a little bit and enjoying some views out the window of my camera as opposed to opening up my window and flooding the entire cabin with light, the flight attendants came around with the mid-flight snacks. And honestly, it was endless to the point where I really couldn't eat that much of it. It came with two full trays of food, one with fresh fruits, the other one with sandwiches and little snacks as well. I love me some good fruit, and the grapes and the apples here were amazing. Ended up actually eating everything that came on this platter. The other tray had some sweets and some savory items, and honestly there was just a little too much food for me. There was a few different sandwiches, I did have one of them. Then there was a couple bags of chips, summer barbecue, and sea salt. There was a bowl of nuts that came with it and then a tray of assorted cookies and sweets. I ended up eating a few things off this tray, but for the most part, I ate the fruit tray and brought a couple things home with me from this other one. As we made our way across India and Bangladesh, I decided to just get fully comfortable and enjoy the seat and get some work done, as there was plenty of space to do that. The only thing I will say is that the individual air vent wasn't exactly enough to keep me cool and with how hot the cabin was kept I ended up having to kick off all my blankets in order to stay comfortable. Even still, I was fairly hot in this cabin. As we flew across Vietnam, honestly, the terrain just looked beautiful. However, we were doing a ton of climbing and descending, so I ended up opening my windows. Looked like we were flying past some of the craziest thunderstorms I had ever seen. As we finished dodging thunderstorms for about an hour, they came by to prepare for my last meal of the flight. 
Starting by of course making the table, and I went for the first course of the meze platter. Although honestly, I was so full after that mid-flight meal, I wasn't quite sure how I would fare for this meal. I decided to go with the mushroom ravioli for my last main course. Considering I was so full from my other courses, I was hoping this would be a little less filling. It was still a perfectly cooked meal in my opinion though. It also might just be the first time I've ever had blueberries on my salad. And as we made our way across the South China Sea, it was time to watch the sunset slowly as we made our way towards the Philippines. Initially, it looked like we were going to land before the sun had completely set and have a nice view of Manila on our way in. However, then we entered a holding pattern for about 30 minutes and then got vectored all the way across the islands of the Philippines before getting brought all the way back in. Kuwait Airways' ability to thrive is unfortunately under extreme pressure just due to the airlines in their proximity. Whether they want to or not, their market share is almost completely shared with Qatar, Etihad, Saudi, and Emirates. Consistently some of the world's all-time best airlines. Kuwait, the country, does have some good money and since they're owned by the government itself, if they decided to grow a bit, I could definitely see them stealing some of that market share. They are however missing a few aspects, but right now I think the biggest thing stopping them is the size of their route network. As we know, the other four major Gulf carriers I mentioned thrive on connecting passengers. Passengers largely from North America and Europe connecting to Asia and Australia via the Middle East and vice versa. Kuwait Airways does offer this experience, but with much less destinations, having only two North American destinations if you want to count Washington DC, which hasn't resumed yet when publishing this video, but will soon. I actually think Terminal 4 at Kuwait International Airport is wonderful. The design and flow of the terminal before and after security makes a ton of sense, so not only does it look wonderful, but the passenger experience is seamless and wonderful as well. 
The only drawback, as with other aspects, is the size. There isn't a ton of space for growth in the current terminal unless they move to the new terminal, which, like I mentioned, I don't see any intentions of that at this point. So, they might run out of gates and remote stands if they continue growing in Terminal 4. The lounges there, especially the new lounges, are wonderful. Super cozy and wonderfully decorated, but once again they may struggle to hold all the passengers and still keep their intimate feel if they grow. Onboard product is the main part that people critique and can be broken down into the hard and soft product. I think the hard product is set. There isn't much I would change about the seats themselves. They're an incredible size, the doors and walls are high enough for good privacy, and the real drawback is that I wish the mattress pad was a bit more cushiony for sleep. The soft product is almost perfect. The main highlight was the fantastic crew that interacted well with me throughout the flight. I just wish they had maybe offered a turndown service. The food selection was good, but maybe not as extensive as the first classes of Emirates and Qatar. I did find it a bit unfortunate to not have amenity kits or slippers, and find it strange that they only supply them on select routes, and even weirder that one of their longest flights, this one to Manila, is not one of those routes. Then I was also a bit okay with the Wi-Fi not working because I had stuff to get done on this flight, but it could have otherwise been a nuisance. The biggest thing with that is that if I understood the purser correctly, we got free messaging but still had to pay for Wi-Fi in first class. That should never happen if you want to remain competitive with the other carriers offering a similar product. Even United Airlines Economy Class offers free messaging and soon to be free unlimited Wi-Fi. Basically, I'll give their hard product a 10 out of 10. I do actually find it to be competitive and right up there with the best. Their soft product and management gets maybe a 6 or 7 out of 10. They have so much promise but seem to be going backwards from the stance of not only their competitors but the rest of the aviation market. I would say the lack of amenity kits and alcohol do hurt that onboard experience of the airline, not to mention some discriminatory practices on selling tickets to people with citizenship of certain countries in their history, which just isn't a practice I generally condone. I really wanted to make my final judgment of Kuwait Airways first class in contrast to its airline neighbors, whether that's fair or not, in order to decide if I would fly with them again in the future. As far as I see it, the seats are competitive when comparing it, and I actually find it to be better than airlines like Qatar. The soft product is just what I feel lowers their rating. In my mind, whether they want to or not, they're in competition with the other Gulf carriers, all of which have a significantly better soft product, including the food, entertainment, and internet. Root strategy, I feel, also plays a big part in their success, as I've seen Kuwait Airways first class for much less than Emirates and Etihad's prices, so in that case, I could see people choosing it over a competition if it's at a lower price. The other piece is the choice of destination. There's definitely a market of people going from America and Europe to Kuwait for business largely, but to really fill their cabins, I'd assume they'd want to corner some of the connecting passengers with the typical bank tub and spoke method. I feel like all that sounds maybe a bit harsher than what I really felt like, but only because of its comparisons. I really did have a great time on board and enjoyed the flight. If priced well enough, I would definitely fly with Kuwait Airways again, especially with how wonderful everyone was, both on the airplane and in the country. And I will say that they are definitely priced better than their competition, offering long haul and transatlantic first class services for under 2000 US dollars at times. I'm extremely curious to know your thoughts on Kuwait Airways, however, so leave a comment down below and give me a follow on Instagram with my username down in that caption. Until next week, however, safe travels, and I'll see y'all next time.